If you've been shooting for a long time, chances are you have a robust collection of lenses that you're not ready to stop using just because you switched to the Lumix system. When it comes to adapting lenses for the Lumix system, there's one thing you need to be aware of. Is your lens passive or active? Active lenses have electronic contacts on the back of the lens that allow communication between the lens and the camera body. In many cases, this is actually required to control things like aperture or focus. Without that communication, the lens will not actually be able to be focused or control the aperture. So you'll want to make sure that you're using an adapter for the lens that will support it. If you have a lens that does not have any electronic contacts on the back, then that's a passive lens. That could be a vintage lens or a cinema lens, and those can be adapted as well. However, there's additional information you're going to have to set up inside of the camera to make it work effectively with it. And this is specifically about working with stabilization. So let's get started by working with this EF mounted lens on a Sigma MC21 adapter. I'm just going to pull the lens off here for a moment and show you there's those electronic contacts on the back of the lens, and you can even see the matching contacts inside of the adapter. Because of those contacts, there's full communication between the lens and the camera body. So let's go ahead and take a look at the options that we have for stabilization. I'll jump into the menu system, and the same menu I'm going to look at exists in both the photo menu and in the video menu. We can access the same controls in either menu, it's just a matter of convenience. There are, however, certain controls that are only applicable to video, and I'll point those out when we get to those. Let's go ahead into the photo menu, over to the others photo menu, and then to image stabilizer. From here, you have access to all the different controls. Let's start at the top with operation mode. The first one is normal. This is five axis stabilization, where the image sensor is moving up and down, left and right, rotating, and has pitch and yaw control for full five axis stabilization. The next option is auto. Auto has all the same controls as normal, except that it will automatically disable horizontal or left to right panning stabilization when it detects that you are panning with your camera. If it didn't, then the camera would fight against you as you're trying to track a subject. Also, this mode is not available in video mode. This is specifically for still photography. The other option down here is off, so you can turn off stabilization entirely. I'll go ahead and leave mine in auto. And then the next option is when to activate. Do you want the stabilizer always active or only active when you press the shutter halfway? This is another one where in video, it is set to always. It is always stabilizing when you're in the video mode. The next three options, as you can see here, are specific to video. The first one is e-stabilization, which is an added level of stabilization where the image is actually shifted on the sensor itself while recording. This allows you to get really, really smooth video, but it does punch into the sensor a little bit, cropping in your field of view ever so slightly. The next mode is Boost IS, again, also for video. The Boost IS mode is effectively a tripod or a locked shot. This is going to be an extreme level of stabilization, effectively giving you what it would look like as if you had the camera on a tripod. It will fight you every which way if you try to move that camera, so it is really designed to make it look like you're on a tripod, even if you're not. The last option is anamorphic, and this is for covering anamorphic lenses. If you're using an anamorphic lens, you do need to set the correct stabilization in here for your anamorphic lens. We actually have a complete video on shooting with anamorphic lenses, so I encourage you to watch that one. The last option on here is called lens information, and this is not available right now because this lens is communicating its information to the camera. Just to prove that point, I'll exit out of here and zoom the lens, and you can actually see the focal length displayed on the camera. This is a 24 to 70 zoom lens, and we can see here it goes from 24 to 70. So that lens is communicating to the camera what its focal length is. Now let's work with a passive lens. I'm gonna use this one here. This is an old Russian Helios lens. It's actually an M42 lens that I'm going to adapt. So let's get this thing on here. I'm gonna go ahead and turn off the camera and remove this lens. First of all, if we look at this lens from the top, you can see that it is a 58 millimeter lens and it is a M42 screw mount. So I'm gonna go ahead and mount that to my M42 to L mount adapter. I also want to point out that the aperture is mechanically controlled here, so no communication is necessary between the camera and the lens to control the aperture. It's physically controlled with the ring on the lens. All right, let's get this thing on here. I'll turn the camera on, and a display comes up on the back of the LCD asking if this is the correct lens information. Remember, at this point, the camera has no idea what lens is on there. It's a passive lens. And so it is bringing up the last lens settings that I had programmed into the camera and asking if that's correct. It's asking here if the 32 millimeter focal length is correct or if I need to change it. It's not correct, so I'm gonna change it. I'll go over here to yes and select that, and that brings me directly into the lens information dialog. Now, if you wanna know how to get into this dialog from any menu, let me go ahead and back out of here. 
into the menu. And then from that same image stabilizer menu, if we scroll down to the bottom, you'll see it says lens information. Now on many Lumix cameras, you will only see a focal length setting in there. On select Lumix cameras, like the S1H that I'm working with here, you actually have an extensive amount of control over that lens. And that's what we're gonna dive into now. I'll go into this menu and starting with lens two, the one that's selected, I'll go ahead and change this. I'll press the display button to change the settings and edit that. And I have a few different options here. First of all, is this lens designed for a full frame sensor or only for a Super 35 or APS-C size sensor? This is a critical setting here. Is your lens actually capable of covering the full field of view of a full frame sensor or only of a Super 35 or APS-C size sensor? In this case, this lens can do full frame, so I'll go ahead and leave it at that. The next option is focal length. Here I need to enter the actual focal length of the lens. In this case, it's 58 millimeter, so I'll go ahead and type that in up to 58 millimeters. Great. The next option is IS area, and this is a really interesting setting. See, a lot of lenses are designed specifically for full frame coverage, but they didn't leave any room in the design for a sensor that moved around because, of course, a lens like this was created long before there were sensors. It was just created for film, which didn't move. In the case of a digital sensor like this one that has the capability of shifting or moving to add stabilization, if the coverage area of the image projected by the lens is too precise and you start to move that sensor off to the edge, you're going to get some vignetting from that lens. And this setting allows us to compensate for that. So let's take a look at what's actually happening here. First of all, you'll see a row of icons on the bottom representing 70 to 100%. We'll come back to that. Take a look in the top left corner there. You see a box that is showing the top left corner of the image. What we're seeing here is the sensor has actually shifted all the way to that extreme, and we're seeing if we can actually identify any vignetting from the lens. In this case, I've actually set things up to really drive the point home. You can see a little bit of a line there. That is just the edge of the wall that I'm pointing at, just to illustrate that edge that might be vignetting on the camera lens. If I then navigate over to the other corner, the sensor shifts and we can see that that corner is a little bit darker. The fact that the sensor is shifting is further driven home by that little black dot that's in the middle of the screen there. That's actually just a piece of black gaffer's tape on my white wall. And that's not necessary. I've just put that there so you can really see how the sensor is shifting. So back over to this. If I go up to this corner or even to this corner here and you notice that my setting is set to 100%, I can dial that down, telling the camera to shift the sensor only 90, 80, or 70% of its capable movement. Now, as I go back and forth here, you'll see that there's a lot less vignetting happening, and we're no longer seeing that mark in the corner. As I zoom this back out, you'll see that mark come back into place. So once again, we are quite simply shifting the sensor just a little bit less to make sure that we have maximum stabilization without pushing into the vignetted corners of that lens. I'm gonna go ahead and set this one to 80%. Next, I can name the lens. This allows me to save my preset so that I can call it up at any time based off the name of the lens or whatever name I want to give it. This is a Helios lens, so I'm going to go ahead and type that in here. There we go. That is now set in. I'll save that. And now I have a preset named Helios set to 58 millimeter with full frame coverage and an IS area of just 80%. I'll roll up to the next lens that I've saved before, lens number one. Notice here that this one has an image circle of full frame but the focal length is set to 56.8 millimeter. What a strange number, where did that come from? Well, this lens is actually going to be a medium format lens that has been adapted with a focal reducer. This particular focal reducer is a 0.71X, so the actual focal length of this lens is no longer 80 millimeters. It is, in this case, 56.8 millimeters. The IS coverage area can stay at 100%, and I've named this combination 80 millimeter plus the M645SL. That's the name of the adapter that I have on here. So let's go ahead and swap these lenses out again. I'll turn off the camera, remove that lens, put the other one on here. Now, when I turn the camera back on, it'll come up with that focal length that I had set earlier, the 80 millimeter plus the M645 for an actual focal length on this lens of 56.8 millimeters. Now, just to make this abundantly clear, that number that I've entered in there, the 56.8 millimeters, is 80 millimeters, the native focal length of this lens, multiplied by the focal reducer, in this case, 0.71. If you were using a focal expander, that number would have to be entered in there as well. So if it was a 1.4x expander, you'd have to do the math to put the appropriate focal length in. Remember, this is the actual focal length of the lens or lens and adapter combination, not the effective focal length of what is hitting the sensor. So if you're working with micro four thirds, do not add the doubling for the micro four thirds sensor. You're adding the number that is just that lens or that lens and adapter combination. And that's what you need to know to work with adapted lenses on your Lumix camera.
Panasonic.